welcome to Assemblies of God Great Britain. You're watching a recorded message from our National Conference 2022. Enjoy the message and for more great content, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've been in ministry for 42 years. I'm as passionate now as I've ever been when I first started. Okay, now I know what Glyn's asked me to, 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 to do now, uh, but I, I want to widen the brief a bit. I, I want to say to you, if I had to say to you, from my experience of being in ministry for 42 years, what would that be? And so it would be three things. And one of those three is what I've been asked to speak on. But I wanted to speak about all three of them. Look up, look in, look out. Worship, well-being, witness. That is what we do. We look up, we look in, we look out. Worship, well-being, witness. And it's, it's holding all those three. It's holding them together that's very important. Look up, look up. That beautiful story in Mark chapter four, verse 35. Jesus said, let us go to the other side of the lake. They took Jesus in the boat, but soon a fierce storm came and the boat began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a pillow. The disciples woke him up saying, teacher, don't you care, we are going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Don't you love that story? I love that story. I love the, the fact that Jesus first said, let us go to the other side. So, you know, why did they forget that? Because Jesus said, well, let us go to the other side. That, that means they are going to go to the other side. Yeah, they are. And, and he's sleeping on a pillow. And it's like, how does that work? I mean, I'm in a hotel room and I can hear the, I can hear the ticking of a clock. I'm like, where's the clock? Where's the clock? I mean, he's in, he's in the boat. There's waves and storms and he's fast asleep. He doesn't need to worry. And he told us not to worry. He told us not to be anxious. He was at peace. And then they wake him up and they say to him, oh my word, the most insensitive thing that they could say to him, don't you care? Oh my word, that's not, that's not kind, is it? Don't you care? We're going to drown. Don't you care? I, I, I kind of feel like Jesus wanted to say to them, hey boys, do you honestly think this boat would sink with me in it? <laughs> I mean, honestly, do you think it would sink with me in it? And then he speaks to the storm, he speaks to the water and calm comes. And then, they, and then he rebukes them for their lack of faith. And they go, who is he? Who is he? Because I think that was when they first discovered who he really was. Because they knew only God, the creator of the universe, could speak to creation. And they realized, oh, he, he just spoke to creation. Creation just listened to him. Oh my word. He is the son of God. He is. Now look. The, the interesting thing about this story, I'm sure you've preached on this story, Jesus said, let us go to the other side. So they were just following the instructions of Jesus. But just because they were following the instructions of Jesus didn't mean they weren't going to face a storm. So don't be surprised. If you're in the will of God, you will face storms. 
so it's fine. Don't worry about it. Just make sure Jesus is in the boat with you. Make sure he's in the boat with you. Look, look up. Believe in the providence of God. Believe in the sovereign reign and rule of God. Believe that. I really believe that more than I've ever believed that he is sovereign, he reigns and rules, he's got it. I, I, you know, chill out, it's all right. Look up, look in, look in. Be kind to yourself. So many of us in ministry have got so many irons in the fire, we've actually put the fire out. I know that was very good, wasn't it? (laughs) And do you know what some of us need to do? Some of us need to take some irons out of the fire and stoke up the fire. Stoke up the fire. If our output exceeds our input, then our upkeep will be our downfall. That was even better, wasn't it? (laughs) Repeat, repeat after me. If our output, I said after me. (laughs) If our output exceeds our input, then our upkeep will be our downfall. Now, you and I only have enough time to do the will of God. Okay? Is that true? Yes, it is true. Therefore, if we only have enough time to do the will of God, why do we keep saying we don't have enough time? It has to be because of one of two reasons. One, we are doing things that are not the will of God, or they are the will of God, but someone else should be doing it. Because you and I only have enough time to do the will of God. It's funny, when you go to these type of conferences, and we do a lot of these kind of things, sometimes I'll get asked by leaders, oh, are you busy, J. John? No, I'm not. And they kind of look at me strange. What do you mean? I said, no, no, I'm not busy. I'm in the will of God. I'm keeping in step with the Spirit. I'm doing what I know he wants me to do and I'm trying not to do the things he doesn't. You know, I'm chilled. When I met Rick Warren, I said to him, I can't stand the title of your book. (laughs) He was really upset. (laughs) What's wrong with the title of my book, Purpose Driven Church? I said, driven? Driven? I don't wanna be driven. You know, when Jesus went into the wilderness, there's two kind of interpretations of it from the Gospels. One, one, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Another one is he was driven by the devil. (laughs) Driven. And I said to Rick Warren, I don't want to be driven. I want to be led by the Spirit. None of this driven stuff. Led by. By the Spirit. Now, it's so, so important. Um, um, Pastor Agu, last night, he, he, he mentioned this, the story of Jesus walking on the water. Okay, let me pick up that story just a little bit more. Okay, the disciples are in the boat. Okay, Peter sees someone walking on the water. And he's like, what, what, is that you, Jesus? So the first thing we've got to do is, is discern if something is Jesus. Is it Jesus? Is it the devil? Or is it me? Okay? The discernment is so, so important. Okay. Secondly, Peter says to Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you. Jesus says, Come. Never get out of the boat unless he's given you permission. Okay, if he has not given you permission, do not get out of that boat. Okay, now, Peter had starting faith, but he didn't have persevering faith. 
So when the waves rose up, he started to look at the waves and he started to sink. So it's very important that we listen to the instructions of Jesus and we not only have starting faith, but we have persevering faith. Okay, now look after yourself. Be kind to yourself. You know, what do they say on the airplane, the, 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 the air stewards? They go, should we require the use of oxygen mask? Put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you put it on other people. You know, I love it what God said to Elijah. I mean, the great prophet Elijah, he's depressed, he's discouraged, he's scared because of a woman, all this kind of stuff, everything else. And what does God say to Elijah? This is God's advice. Elijah, I want you to do two things. I want you to have a a nap, and then I want you to have a snack. (laughs) Do you think that's lovely? That's God's advice. I want you to, first of all, to have a nap, and then have a snack. And look at the snack he had. He baked him a cake. God bakes it. I mean, you think he'd bake him some bread or something. No, he bakes him a cake. He wakes up, he's got this beautiful cake. He eats the cake. From the cake, he can survive for the next 40 days. Isn't it incredible? You know, some of you need to have a nap and have a snack. I'm telling you that some of you need to have a nap and have a snack. Some of you are not getting enough naps. Some of you are not getting enough sleep, so your body is not being repaired, restored, rejuvenated, revived. You need to be getting your sleep. You've got to learn to say no. Your job as a leader is not to meet everyone's need. Your job as a leader is to make sure everyone's need is met. That's different. Now, my relatives are talked about in, in the New Testament, in the Acts chapter six, my relatives, the Greek-speaking widows, are being neglected in the distribution of food. And the matter is brought to the apostles. And the apostles said, oh yes, a very important issue regarding social responsibility. But they said, this is not important for us. Wow, it's, it's an important issue, but not important for them. And what did they do? They found seven Pentecostals. (laughs) I mean, how good for your denomination. They found seven people full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, if it was me, I would have found seven social workers, but they, (laughs) they, they found seven Pentecostals And they said to the Pentecostals, look after this issue regarding social responsibility and we will turn, turn our attention to two things, prayer and the ministry of the word. So you could say, based on that one story, the apostolic priorities were prayer and the ministry of the word. And then what does it say? And the church grew. So everyone is looking for methodology. Oh, what kind of methodology would you suggest, J. John? You know, what kind of, listen, prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer, and a friend of mine who I'd been mentoring, he, he became a vicar in Notting Hill. And he rings me up, he goes, oh, J. John, have you heard? I'm the new vicar of Notting Hill. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, what advice have you got for me? I said, here's my advice. Monday to Friday, not on your day off, not on Sunday, I want you to walk around your community one hour a day, praying and greeting people. Praying and greeting people, praying in English, praying in tongues. I tell him this, he goes, you got any other advice? I said, are you an idiot? I said, I just told you what to do. I said, you just pray one hour a day around your community, praying and greeting people one hour a day, every day. You do that for a year. I tell you, the whole community will be transformed. How many leaders do that? Not many. Not many leaders do that. I've been up and down this country for four decades, north, south, east, west. I would suggest to you, from my conversations with leaders, those are the two things that leaders do the least. 
prayer and the ministry of the word. That's your priority. Your priority is prayer and the ministry of the word. Your priority is not, is not to get engaged in feeding the people who are being neglected in the distribution of food. You have to implement others to do that. That's not you. This is your priority. And the church grew, and the church grew, and the church grew. How did it grow? Prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer and the ministry of the word. When I was just starting out as an evangelist, I'd only been an evangelist three years, I think, and um, John Stott invited me to go and have tea with him. I mean, what an honor. I was like, oh my word, he wants to talk to me about world evangelization. So I go to his... um, uh, I go to his office, uh, I, he gets me a cup of tea, we sit down, he says to me, now J. John, tell me about your devotional life. I said, I'm sorry? <laughs> he says, tell me about your devotional life. I said, well, what does that mean? He says, tell me about your prayer life. I'm like, I thought we were gonna talk evangelism. What's all this about prayer? And, and then when you don't know what to, to say, you always ask a question, well, tell me about yours. <laughs> John Stott said this, well, J. John, I try, I try to pray and read the scriptures one hour a day, one afternoon a week, one day a month, and one week a year. I remember I walked out of, of his office and I, and I thought, what, well, one hour a day, one afternoon a week, one day a month, one week a year. I thought, I could do that. I, I can do that. And, and I started then, like, that was my goal. I didn't always keep it if I was on a mission, if I were whatever, you know, but I would always aim to do that. And I'd do a whole day a month in prayer, just prayer and my reading the scriptures and soaking in the word of God. And, and I, I know people like uh, David Shearman and, and Paul Weaver and others, they, they've, they've done that and do that. So I just want to encourage you in that. Look up, look in, look out. I get many uh, people wanting to come and see me, but particularly evangelists. And, um, and I always say to them, I reply to them when they want to come, and I say, if you were going to meet me, what question would you ask me? And then depending on their question, I'll decide whether I'll see them or not. <laughs> anyway, I end up seeing a few, but remember, I'm not going to spend all my time doing that. Of course, I want to in part in a new generation of evangelists. Of course, I wanna raise a new generation of evangelists. And if you are an evangelist, we run an evangelist conference every January. You, you gotta be there. Just pick it up. You pick up the, the, the impartation that's there. Right, but um, so these evangelists come and basically the conversation goes a bit like this. Uh, how can I help you? And they go, oh, J. John, I want to do what you do. And I go, what do you think I do? (laughs) You see? And what they think is this. They play soccer, I play soccer. Okay? But they think I play for the premiership. That's what they think. They're like, oh, J. John, you play for the premiership. And and I I really want to play for the premiership as well. And then I go, oh, well, you only have to do two things. And they're like, really? (laughs) Two things. Most of them are not even taking notes. So I then like milk it a bit and I go, oh, you, do you not want to take notes? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then do you want me to get your notebook? You know, take notes. Oh no, they get their phones out. Okay, well it's two things. If you do these two things, you can play in the premiership. They're like, amazing. All right, and I'm like teasing them. One, two. Ready? You ready? One, one, holiness. Two, humility. Now, I'm not saying I'm holy and humble, but I'm telling you this, and I'm telling them this, and I'm telling myself this. If I don't have holiness and seek holiness and humility, I'm disqualified. I'm disqualified. Holiness, holiness, keep clean. Keep clean. You know, the the beatitude, uh, the pure shall see God. The word pure in Greek, gatharos, it it means, the root meaning of that word is no mixed motives. I've got no mixed motives. I've got no other agenda. 
No other agenda. I just want to keep clean. I want to keep clean. I want to keep holy. I want to keep holy. You know, all the other things. Yeah, of course I can connect these people. Of course I can open doors for them. Of course I can suggest this and this and this. But listen, if you haven't got holiness and humility, there's no point doing all that. Humility. Humility is to receive praise and to pass it on to God untouched. That's what humility is. And we saw that demonstrated in the last session. My friend Amy was, she knocked it out of the ballpark. It was, it was amazing. I mean, she said, oh, wasn't Pastor, 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 I sat next to her last night and she said, oh, wasn't Pastor Agu, you know, you know on fire. I said to her, on fire, you were on fire. You were on fire. But then when we applauded just to give thanks, Jesus Jesus, you know, it was, I, it was quite moving, wasn't it? Just let it go to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, okay, now I'm going to move on to the third point just before I do. You know, I, I've met a lot of leaders now. Um, and I say, oh, you know, what's your position? Oh, I'm the lead pastor. What? Where did that come from? <laughs> you don't get James and you don't get Peter going around, I'm the lead apostle. I mean, I know there are 12, but I'm the lead. Where did that nonsense sneak in? I don't go around going, I'm the lead evangelist. Not just evangelist, I'm the lead. Listen, drop all that nonsense, drop all that nonsense. You're not the lead. There's only one lead. He's called the Good Shepherd. Jesus. He's the lead. So this week, if you call yourself lead, if you call yourself all this kind of nonsense, this week, drop it. You're now pastor. Pastor, it doesn't matter what rank you are. You're just a pastor. You're a pastor, you're, you're, you're an evangelist, or whatever you are, that's what you are. Look up, look in, look out, look out, look out. We have a great commission. Oh, wow. The great commission is amazing. Isn't it amazing, the great commission? Where is it? <laughs> Here it is. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What does it say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Okay, the Greek word. Let me teach you a Greek word. The Greek word for go means go. <laughs> go and make disciples. And one of your favorite Penty verses, Acts 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. The Great Commission, go out and make disciples, baptize them, teach them all that I've commanded you. What does that say? You've got to make them first and then you've got to mark them and then you've got to mature them. Make them, mark them, mature them. I, I go to churches where they've never been made but we've marked them and we're trying to mature them. I then go to other churches where they have been made, no one's marked them, but we're trying to mature them. Then I go to other churches, they've been made and marked, no one's maturing them. That's the goal. We're out to make disciples, mark them, baptize them, identify them as believers, and then to mature them. And we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. The Greek word for witness, marturia, from which we derive the word martyr. 
it will cost. So don't be surprised if you will be persecuted, but don't encourage persecution, but should you be persecuted, it's part of the deal. It's okay. When uh, our firstborn son, Michael, he was about two years of age, two and a half, and Killy and I, uh, we were living in Nottingham, and there was a Virgin mega store. And Michael, Killy, and I, we went to the Virgin Megastore. It was l- lots of floors. We were down in the basement, and we were like pottering, looking, and Michael was here, and like that, and we're just looking around. I looked down, he's gone. It's like, no, Michael, Michael, Michael. And, and Killy started running around. I said, where is he? Where? We couldn't find him. It's like, no, has he been snatched? And, and then we thought, there's no way he could have gone up to the next floor and, and it's like, I, we saw him like a minute ago. And it's like, so I ran up and I'm stopping people. Have you seen the little boy? Um, da, 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 and I'm, no. And then I, I, I go to a counter and I say to one of the staff, listen, I've lost my son. And they kind of just looked at me. And I said, have you got one of those tannoy things? They said, yes, we have. I said, can I use it? They said, no, you can't. I said, give it to me. (laughs) I jumped over the counter. I took hold of the tannoy and I said, excuse me, all shoppers in Virgin Megastore, please stop shopping. And I noticed people weren't stopping shopping. I said, did you not just hear what I just said? (laughs) A little boy is lost. He's got a little blue jacket. His name is Michael. Please look now. I couldn't care less what people thought of me. Why would I care what people thought of me? I lost my son. Why would it worry me what you thought of me? See, that's the kind of analogy that is used in the Bible. You know, a missionary is not someone who crosses the sea. A missionary is someone who sees the cross. When you've seen the cross of Jesus, in the words of the Apostle Paul, the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me to seek and to save the lost. People who do not know Jesus are lost. Killy showed me this scripture this morning. This is, the scripture starts, this is from 1 John 5 verse 11. This is, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. These are the people we're talking about. They do not have life. They are lost. We have been given a commission to seek and to save the lost. So we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Jesus gives us a geographical strategy Okay, what what did that represent to the first disciples of Jesus? What did Jerusalem represent? Well, that was where they denied Jesus. Peter denied Jesus publicly. Where were they at the crucifixion? Only John was there. So Jesus was implying, I want you to start in the place of your greatest failure. Where is that for most people? Family, friends, neighbors, colleagues. So in other words, if you're going to reach the world, you reach the world by reaching your world, by engaging with those people with whom you have a common kinship with, family and friends, with those with whom you have a common community with, neighbors and colleagues, with those with whom you have a common interest with. So hypothetically, take a church. Let's say you're pastoring a church. You've got 100 members. If if I was pastoring that church, this is what I would do. I would encourage those 100 people to be doing three things. First of all, praying. And I would say to them, I want you to pray for at least 10 people that you know who don't yet know the Lord. 10 people, family, friends, 
neighbors, colleagues. Now, if everybody did that, 100 member church, everyone's praying for 10 people, that means 1,000 people are being prayed for. One thousand. Now, Killy and I, every day, we wake up in the morning, every day, we wake up at six, we listen to the news headlines, first thing we do, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Then we pray for ourselves, then we pray for our family, then we have a whole list of people that we pray who are sick, and then we pray for 42 people who we know who don't know Jesus. We pray for the 42 people every morning, every day, every week, every month, every year. Sometimes the list goes down, sometimes it goes up. But at the moment, we've got 42 people. We pray for them by name. Lord, open the, the eyes, their eyes, open the eyes of their hearts. Lord, speak to them during the day. Lord, speak to them in dreams. Lord, speak to them. Why? Because we know that when we pray, coincidences happen. So I would encourage you to be that type of a person, as well as encouraging your congregations to be far more intentional in praying. Secondly, praying and caring. You can't pray and not care. And people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And so I know many of you and many of your churches do care for the poor. They do care for the people in the community. And it's wonderful what you do do. And I just want to reinforce that it's praying and it's caring. Now, Killy and I, we were walking around where we live. We frequently go for walks, prayer walks, and we're walking and we're praying. And I sometimes pray in English, I pray in tongues, I pray in Greek. And we're walking around and I see this lady. And I said to Killy, is that the woman that lives like six doors up from us who has a sick son? And Killy said, I think it is. And at that moment, you have a little battle. Shall I, shan't I? Mm, shall I go? Shall I not? Have I got time? Have I not got time? All this kind of... There's always this battle kind of going on. And, um, but by the way, I'm, I'm going to pause that story, hold that, and I'll tell you another story. <laughs> I will come back to that story, but I'm going to tell you why I, something changed in me. Okay, I said to Killy, I feel God wants me to go and pray for this woman. And she said, you better go. And I said, oh yeah, I, it's, a, it's an hour's drive. I'll end up spending an hour with this woman. It'll be an hour back, oh, three hours. Okay, I've got to find three hours. So I didn't go. And then a couple of months go by, I feel I should go and pray for this woman. And I said, oh, Killy, I just feel I should go and pray for this woman. She said, you, you should go. And uh, I didn't go. And then um, some time passes, six o'clock news, comes on in the morning, headline news, she's died. The lady's called Amy Winehouse. Now you're saying, well, how on earth could you have got to her? Because she lived in my cousin's house. But she rented my cousin's house in London. My cousin said to me, because she, well, we get on, I love her, she loves me, and, and uh, she's like, oh, John, Amy needs somebody like you. Uh, just tell me when you want to go, and I'll take you to the house. And I didn't go. I did not go. God told me to go, and I didn't go. I was, oh, I could, I was just so remorseful, repentant, and I thought, oh, Lord, I didn't go. I should have gone. You told me to go, and I didn't go. And, and I thought, Lord, because I didn't go, did, did you send someone else? Did you, act, did you send someone else? Because I didn't go. And I vowed that day that I would do anything, go anywhere, and do whatever. So whenever I get a quiver in the liver, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm always assuming it's, it's the Lord. So there's this woman. I still have a battle going on, but I reject the battle. 
I go up to the woman and I said, excuse me, is your name Barbara? And she says, yes, it is. She says, I know who you are. And I said to her, I've heard that you have a son who's sick. She says, yes, I do. In fact, he's dying. She said, can you go now to the hospice and pray for my son? And I thought, what does she think I do all day? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? You see, even though you know what you're going to do, you're, you're battling with thought. And I said, we're going. We then walked back home. We had to pick up the car. We had to drive to the hospice. Now, her son, she's only got one son. She's a single mother, 32 years of age, the son. And we, we, we go to the son. His name's Johnny. I said, hi, Johnny. Um, I, I'm a minister. I've just met your mother. And your mother has asked me to come and pray for you. Would you like that? And he stared me out. Literally, just looked at me in the eyes. Didn't say anything, just stared me out. And he goes, I'd rather have a hug. Killy and I bent down and he kind of lifted himself up and the three of us just embraced each other. And he starts crying. Killy starts crying. I start crying. And we hold each other. And then he lets go. We let go. And, and I said, Johnny, do you want the prayer anyway? <laughs> he goes, look, I'm an atheist. But if you need to pray, go ahead. So I did. I put my hand on his heart. I just put my hand on his heart. And I prayed inside. I didn't pray outside. I didn't become all Pentecostal. <laughs> oh, she came on a Honda. <laughs> oh, I'll have a shandy. You want a shandy? <laughs> what, you want a shandy on your Honda? Oh, rubber dinghy, rubber dinghy. <laughs> no, I didn't do any of that. I just put my hand on his heart. And inside, 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 I just said, Lord, this guy needs a miracle. This guy needs a miracle. I then spoke to him for, and I just said, Amen, that's it. And I said, I started to talk to him. I said, would you like me to, to visit you? He goes, I'd love it if you would visit me. Now, you know, before you're a Christian, you're in negative territory. And then when you're a Christian, you cross a line, you're born again, uh, you're, you, you receive Christ, you're saved, and you're in positive territory. When you're in minus territory, you can go up to minus 100. He was minus 100. I started visiting him. Every time I visited him, I noticed a change. Minus 90, minus 80, minus 70, minus 60. Minus, I noticed it every time I kept going. And then he was like minus 10. And I, w I went to speak to him. And he was in agony. He was in agony. And I, I didn't feel it was the time to talk. But I, I was just by him. I knelt by him. And, and, but his, his face, his countenance changed. Anyway, next morning, early in the morning, knock on the door. It's the mother. And she says he's, he died. And the mother's a, a new ager. And she's like a new ager with a bit of Jesus and a bit of this and a bit of that. <coughs> Lovely lady. And she goes, would you, would you speak at the funeral? I said, of course I'll speak at the funeral. Of course I will. Now, I didn't realize how famous he was. He was a really famous nightclub DJ. I didn't know that. I mean, I knew he was a DJ. I didn't know he was a famous nightclub DJ. There were 800 people at the funeral. I was the speaker. I was the speaker. I, I, I finished speaking. I kind of stepped down. I was mobbed. I was actually mobbed. And, and people are like, uh, uh, Reverend John, and, and they're trying to get my attention. And people are pulling my arm, trying to get my attention this way. Uh, Reverend John, what did you mean? What did you mean that you can go to heaven via King's Cross? Well, you know that, don't you? You know that you can go to heaven if you go via King's Cross. That is the only route. You can't go there any other way. Now, here's the point. Killy and I just walking around where we live. Lord, we need a revival where we live in Chorleywood. Lord, we need a revival in, in England. We need it in the United Kingdom. Lord, we need it in the world. Please, Lord. You get a quiver in your liver. Is that the woman? 
Maybe it is. She says, go and see her son in the hospice. I do. Well, I end up preaching to 800 people and telling them a little bit about the gospel and how to go to heaven. You know, praying, caring, and sharing. Sharing. Most Christians have taken literally what Jesus said to three disciples. See that you tell no one. Most Christians are like Arctic rivers. They're frozen at the mouth. You know, what is our job? Our job is to go into God's orchard. And what do we do? We check the fruit. We check the fruit. We're the fruit checkers. We're the fruit checkers. You know, if the fruit's not right for picking, you don't pick it. You don't pick the fruit. You don't meet a woman and you, you notice that she's expectant and say, well, how many months are you? Oh, you're seven, seven months. Oh, push it out. Push it out. Push it out. <laughs> now, let's be honest. A lot of Pentecostal evangelism is like that. You know, <laughs> Look, she's got another two months to go. <laughs> Look, if the fruit's not right for picking, you don't pick the fruit. Now, if the fruit is ripe for picking, what do you do? You, you pick it, because if you don't pick the fruit, one of two things happens. One, it overripes, falls to the floor and dies, or two, the Jehovah's Witnesses pick it. <laughs> You see, we're up against a lot of competition. If you and I don't pick the fruit, someone else is gonna pick it. There are two reasons today why people are not yet Christians. One, they've never met a Christian. Two, they have met a Christian. <laughs> now, the Apostle Paul. So, we have gotta be encouraging, equipping, helping our people to know how to pray, to know how to care, to know how to share. I, I, I spoke at this university, and it, I, I don't want to say it was a revival, but whoa, not bad. <laughs> the largest auditorium of the university was too small, so we had to move the meetings outside, 4,000 students outside. And I preached, I stepped down, somebody was talking to me, a girl comes along, interrupts us, and says, I hated what you said. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. She says, I can tell you this, church ruins people's lives. I said, oh, I'm really sorry that you feel that. I said, have you got some time? She's like, why? I said, have you got some time for a coffee? And she's like, I don't know. I said, well, I'm not gonna wait here all day. Have you got time for coffee? <laughs> So we go for coffee, we go for coffee. I said, I said why, why are you so angry? Blech, all this stuff comes out. You know, I don't try and justify it. I just listen. I said, come and hear me tomorrow. Don't you like it when the music comes on? It, it, it means shut up and get off. <laughs> but I've still got three minutes. I said, come and hear me Tuesday, and we'll go for coffee, she did. I said, come and hear me Wednesday, we'll go for coffee, she we did. I said, come and hear me Thursday, and we'll go for coffee, so she did. I said, there's one more meeting. Come and hear me Friday, we'll go for coffee. Friday, she's ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. In Cain. Five coffees. Just disentangle people's misunderstandings. Help introduce them to Jesus. You know, we gotta teach people how to pray, care, share. And I, I, I've got an evangelism training course, six weeks. So, you know, use mine or use someone else, use Mark Greenwood's or, you know, or write your own. But until you've written your own, use mine. <laughs> Become far more intentional in doing that. 
I, I was talking to Glyn last night while we were having supper, and I said, look, I, I, this is my take. Yes, of course, people can come, of course they can come to any service every Sunday or whatever. Of course they can. But I personally feel what we should do is develop a culture of confidence. And I would suggest to you, church leaders, is have one Sunday a month and call it a plus one Sunday. Just one Sunday a month. It's a Sunday, you're not gonna completely change the service, but you're gonna tweak it slightly. You'll be more selective in your songs. You'll be very careful in the announcements and the notices. You'll be very careful about the prayer. Your hospitality will just be a little bit better. And it's called a plus one Sunday. And so what you do at that Sunday, once a month, you could do it 12 times a year, you could do it nine times a year, is that you, you, you simply preach the gospel. And then maybe a couple of times a year, three times a year, what you do is you bring in, you see most church leaders are like GPs. They have to know a little about a lot, okay? People like Mark, Richie and myself, we're obstetricians. That's our speciality. And there is something, we don't know how, but we, we know this, if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through us. And, and he seems to. You know, so bring in a Mark Ritchie, bring in a J. John, bring in a Mark Greenwood, bring in, you know, and to preach the gospel. And it just gives people that confidence to do that. I'm going to go and do that at Ian Duthie's church up in Scotland. I'm doing the Christmas service. In fact, in fact, I'm, I'm going to do a mission. This is so, in, uh, Kensington Temple, Mark Ryan, he phoned me up. He says, J. John, you need to help us. We, we need to preach the gospel. And I was like, well, you're not doing too bad, actually. No, he goes, we really need to reach out to the lost. I, I'm going to do 10 Wednesdays for him. January, February, March, I'm going to do the Ten Commandments series, 10 Wednesdays. And, and during this conference, because I was thinking about it, well, I'm, I'm locked in now. I'm locked in for 10 weeks. I can't really go away for a week. And it, I'm locked in. And while I was at this conference, I, I feel like I'm go, I want to offer the 10 Sundays to you. If any of you want me to come and preach the gospel mid-January to mid-March, I'm offering 10 Sundays. So uh, Mark doesn't know this. He's offering 10 Sundays as well. <laughs> right? Amy doesn't know this yet, but she's offering 10 Sundays. Okay, well, well, that's a start. At least Amy can give you as many as she's free. I'm giving you 10. Maybe Mark's got 10, and we're offering you 25, 25 slots, you know, to preach the gospel. And you, you can, have, if you want meat, go, go for Amy. If you want ice cream, go for Mark. <laughs> if you want a bit more, ask me. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Thank you for tuning in with us wherever you are. To find out more about Assemblies of God Great Britain and for more information about our upcoming events, please visit aoggb.com.